Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our friends of the forums on tolerance. Welcome to our Japanese friends. Yo koso. Yo koso. Thank you for attending the 26th Forum on Tolerance, a North Shore Community College event that began 14 years ago. The purpose of the forum is to educate us about our differences, which can enable us to be more accepting of others and more humane. A professor of mine taught his students to strive for unity in diversity. And so it is with our forums on tolerance. Tonight's forum is entitled Tolerance in a Time of Intolerance and is devoted to exploring moral decision making. Who could be a better model for moral decision making than Sugihara? How many in the audience have ever heard of Sugihara? Yes, S-U-G-I-H-A-R-A. -A. Sugihara was the Japanese consul in Lithuania in the year 1940. Throngs of Jewish refugees with tears in their eyes and some kissed his feet gathered at the consulate and begged him for transit visas to Japan in order to flee from the Nazis. Two years earlier in 1938, the night of broken glass, Kristallnacht, the gigantic riot orchestrated by the Nazis against Jews of Germany and Austria took place and Jews decided to leave. Where to? U.S. President Roosevelt called representatives of 32 nations together in Avion, France, to discuss the refugee problem. The outcome was that no country was willing to take Jewish refugees, with the minor exception of the Dominican Republic, which accepted about 1,000 ostensibly to whiten its race. The Nazis wanted to prove to the world that Jews were an unwelcome commodity by colluding with the president of Cuba in 1939 not to admit Jews bound for Cuba from Germany on the SS St. Louis. Thus the ship with 937 Jewish refugees returned to Germany and many were forced into concentration camps and murdered. The door for Jews was closed. The only possibility for refugee safe haven was Japan. If the refugees could obtain transit visas to cross Russia to sail to Japan, it would follow invariably that Jewish people would forever be grateful to the Japanese government for saving them. Sugihara was faced with a moral dilemma. Should he be altruistic or should he walk away, which psychologists call bystander apathy? Just as Sugihara had to make a moral judgment, we too are faced with moral issues to resolve in our own personal lives. In order to motivate you to continue to think more about moral decision making after tonight's program has concluded, the Tolerance Committee of the college has prepared a thought-provoking series of questions on the back of the white program inside your folder. The folder also contains a lilac colored sheet called a guide to moral decision making for your consideration. In addition to the folder, you were given a button, I'm wearing my button, with slogans by Edmund Burke and Martin Niemöller, 
as shown on the screen behind me. And the reason for doing this is to stimulate your thinking about the importance of standing up against injustices and in the spirit of this past Tuesday's election to campaign for doing what is right. Now it is my honor to call upon the president of North Shore Community College, Dr. Wayne Burton, to greet us. Good evening and, and welcome to North Shore Community College. This is a wonderful evening and we're very honored by the presence of the, of the, uh, the Japanese uh, embassy, embassy, I guess, and Consul General, uh, who you'll meet in a second, uh, Mr. Kazuko, and uh, his assistant, Mika Iga, is here also. And thank you for being here. We are very honored and flattered. We've been doing these programs for some time, but there's a common theme that runs through all of them, and at the moment of greatest need, leaders emerge with courage and bravery and, and, and moral outrage in some cases, and, and it's extraordinarily important that we hear the stories so all of us can try to emulate that kind of, of behavior. Um, this is, for those of you who don't know, this is one of four sites of North Shore Community College. We have upwards of 17,000 students uh, now enrolled at the college in credit and not credit, and uh, we're very proud of that. The flags you see in this gymnasium represent the countries of origin of our students. We ran out of space when we got to 100, and that's the kind of college we are. We welcome everyone here, including the Japanese flag, which has been flying in our gym for some time, and the Israeli flag, um, because we honor everyone. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like, it's my pleasure to introduce the Vice President for Academic Affairs to bring greetings, Paul Frederick. Paul. Thank you, President Burden. It's certainly a pleasure for me to join President Burden, Dr. Brown, members of our committee on presenting this evening's program. Um, it's particularly nice to see, and although it is a stormy evening, our students, members of our college community, uh, as well as um, our faculty who work very hard to put this program together. I also would like to recognize uh, and welcome uh, some special guests from Bunk Hill Community College, Dean William Sakamoto, and at least one or two students from Bunker Hill. So it's great to see our colleagues uh, relatively close by join us for this evening. As Dr. Brown mentioned, this evening is intended to be both educational and informative, and at the end of the day, hopefully it will make us all better human beings. Again, it's great to be here to join with you folks what I'm sure will be a terrific program. And now I toss it back to President Burton. It's now my, my great pleasure and, and certainly honor to, to welcome our guest tonight for, to, for, for remarks. Um, traveling out of Boston on a dismal night. I, I just happened to be out there. He probably thinks we planned it this way, and I greeted him as they arrived, as I do all of our guests when they arrive. But it's my pleasure now to introduce Japan, Japanese Consul General Kazuki of Boston. General Kazuki. Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, Thank you, President Button, and uh, Academic Vice President Friedrich, and uh, Ravi Kohn, and uh, thank you for Professor Brown for taking this initiative to bringing this program to the students of North Shore Community College and the citizens of the Lean. As a, I am a, as a newcomer to the Consul General, I arrived just six weeks ago, and so but as a new, and it is my first time to be in this uh, college and my first trip to this North Shore Community College. And I'm very grateful, Mr. Brown, for inviting me to participate in this vital program of tolerance in the time of intolerance. Dr. Brown and his colleague organized this uh, important lecture series. As a representative of the Japanese government, I'm very grateful that you have included in this series this evening's topics this legendary Chiune Sugihara. I'm very grateful, thank you very much. You will hear much about Mr. Sugihara, 
Actually, I'm very amazed and pleased that many of Han's raised when you, you have heard the name of Sugihara. And uh, I would like to tell you about, of course, you will know learn much about him, but uh, this evening, as uh, I would like to tell you about my some personal connection to him, myself. I have uh, two stories to tell you. First, I, was, I never had the honor of meeting Mr. Sugihara in person. Uh, of course, that I think I feel a certain kinship with him. He was, of course, my great senior colleague in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He also was a diplomat specialized in Russian affairs, as I am. Actually, before, prior to this assignment, I was in the Moscow Embassy, and uh, I spent eight, altogether eight years in Moscow. And so uh, I, I would not be afraid of the uh, winter in Boston. <laughs> but more importantly, but I have an indirect contact with him through my late fa father. Mr. Sugihara left the Ministry of Foreign Affairs after the war and moved to the trading company specialized in the trade with Russia. And my late father also worked for a trade company who was specialized in trade with Russia. And so my father knew Mr. Sugihara personally. And one time, once, I asked about his impression, Mr. Sugihara. My father told me that he spoke excellent Russian. And my father also a very good speaker of Russian. I myself, is my English, my Russian is better than English. When I'm speaking English, I, I always answer that way. But uh, my, my father's English, Russian was very good, but he said, Sugihara spoke excellent Russian. At the same time, he was a dignified man. That was the impression from my father. And uh, I think this is a very important part of the, uh, Mr. Sugihara's personality. Because as a dignified man, he honors the dignity of the others. I believe his dignity and his respect for others help Mr. Sugihara make his courageous decision to help refugees. The other story I would like to tell you that is a, this is a, about the city Kaunas. Okay. I visited, uh, I have a chance to visit Kaunas. That was a former capital of Lithuania. And uh, there, uh, this is where Sigihara was confronted by the human tragedy of Polish Jews desperate to escape from the Nazi troops. This is a Lithuania, you know Lithuania is that the Baltic countries and uh, Kaunas was a former capital and there still stands a uh, building. This is fair and Mr. Sugihara came to understand he was the last possible means of their escape. It was here in the house in the August of 1940 where Consul Sugihara, ignoring the instruction of the Japanese government, signed some 2,000 transit visas, which allowed about 3,000 Jews refugees to enter Japan. The house still stands. This is a rather wooden house and a little bit old, but it still remains where stands where uh, Sugihara used to work. And now turn to the museum, dedicated to the commemoration of Sugihara's courageous uh, actions. I really move, feel very moved when I was in that house. And uh, in that house, Sugihara could easily, for him, that it was easy for him just turn away the petitioners who came to him for help. That would, have, that would have been the end of the matter. But in the difficult days of the World War II, Sugihara found the strength to take the action that the, saved the thousand refugees and as you will learn from this evening's program, Mr. Sugihara was extraordinary and courageous man. Thank you very much.
I, I'm sure when we invited Mr. Kazuki, we didn't, we weren't sure this was, you'd only been here six weeks, and you came from Moscow? Yes. Now, anyone who can endure the winter in Moscow and then come and endure the winter in Boston deserves more than this, what we're about to give you. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is it does get dark here at night, unlike Moscow. It, as a token of the appreciation, and, and we're really honored uh, for you to be here this evening, and your remarks are wonderful. Um, maybe this is the first plaque you'll get. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, good. <laughs> this first plaque. Yes, the first plaque. Uh, uh, and let me read the inscription. The, the Tolerance Committee of North Shore Community College in Danvers, Mass., and Lynn, Mass., proudly recognizes the Honorable Toyoshi, to, Toyisha Kuzuki. Oh, is How right. did I do? Mm -hmm. The spelling's right. right. Spelling's right. Way to go, Sheldon. The spelling's right. Thank you. Uh, the Honorable Kuzuki, uh, Council General of Japan in Boston, at the Sugihara Forum on Tolerance, November fourth, twenty ten. This is presented to you with great gratitude from our college. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This is a great honor for me, and uh, this is the first plaque I received <laughs> since my arrival. And uh, you know that uh, J Japanese is a um, dignified man, at the same time, courteous man. So I have prepared something in return to the uh, president. This, this is a, uh, I bought from, from Japan this rakka box. And, Thank you so much. Uh, for this is a present for you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We'll keep this with honor in, uh, in the Forum on Tolerance and as, a, as a sign of the, the friendship between you and our school and your country and our country. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much. And now, David Hull. David? Thank you, President Burton. Yes, good evening. I'm David Hool, and I'm one of the members of the Committee on Tolerance and a staff member here at North Shore Community College in the Academic Technology Department. Now, as you go through the various parts of our program this evening, I think you'll see a theme developing. And that theme is the theme of moral courage, moral dilemma, or moral judgment. Now, most of us have faced these in one way or another during the course of our lives. A moral dilemma is defined as a complex situation that will often involve an apparent mental conflict between moral imperatives. Obeying one would involve transgressing the other. Now, I'd like to start by just sharing with you a time in my life when I was grappling with the issue of moral courage. It all happened when I was just a freshman in high school, and of course that was just a couple years ago. I remember that I was in my homeroom class, and here there was a group of popular athletic male students who decided for whatever reason to begin to harass the only African-American teenage male in my entire town. His name was Mark. And I was present in the room that day, as were a number of my friends. Now, this group of guys in the room began calling Mark names. They used the term boy. They used the N-word with him. And they started saying some of the stereotypical type things about southern fried chicken and, and a watermelon. And I could see Mark getting very, very upset, getting very angry. He was tensing up. And he seemed like he was really ready to explode. But through all of this taunting, he really held it all in to his credit. Now, while this was happening, my mind became flooded with thoughts. I should do something. But if I do something, if I speak out, will I be safe? Well, of course I'll speak out. My friends in the room will take this on with me. Of course they will. But what if they don't? What if I'm the only person in the room taking on these bullies? Will I be bullied too? 
Will the rest of my time at Leicester High School be pure hell? I couldn't deal with that. Will I be beat up? Will I be hurt? But someone needs to come to Mark's defense. Mark's a great guy, and he shouldn't have to go through this alone. And I wondered why just a few weeks earlier, why I could stand up to my grandfather when he began making comments about the African-American dancers on the Lawrence Welk show, negative comments, of course. And I could speak out and really take that on, but I couldn't do that now. And where was my homeroom teacher during all of this? I mean, surely if he saw this happening, he would take this on. Or would he? Why can't I speak up now? Why am I silent as Mark goes through all this? I don't want to get hurt. Now, to this day, I think about that situation often. And to this day, I still wonder how I could have been more effective in taking that on, more courageous in taking that on. Moral dilemma, moral courage, moral judgment. Tonight, we have an opportunity to look at a DVD that, exam that examines moral dilemma. It's called Sugihara. Conspiracy of Kindness. Among the few Japanese records that survived World War II was a document written in 1940 by diplomat Sugihara to the Japanese ministry. Here, he expressed shock over what was happening to the Jews. Hundreds of Jews were begging to leave Lithuania and escape Nazi Germany's persecution of Jews. Sugihara appealed to his foreign ministry to allow him to write exit visas to help them flee to Japan. However, the foreign ministry turned down Sugihara three times. The moral dilemma? What should he do? Sugihara pondered this. Should he obey his government or should he obey his conscience? conscience? Well, after much soul searching, Sugihara decided to do what's right. He decided to do what's right because it was right. He signed exit visas to save 6,000 Jewish lives. And after the end of the war, Sugihara returned to Japan to continue his diplomatic career. Now let's hear in his wife's own words about what happened. And so we'll start the DVD. <laughs> The homecoming was bleak. They had returned to a bombed out wasteland. Sugihara reported to the foreign ministry, hoping to continue his career. They asked him to stand by for reassignment. After three months, he received a letter from the foreign ministry asking him to come to the office. When he returned, he looked so disappointed. I asked him what was the matter. He said they wanted him to resign from the foreign ministry. They told him, you know the reason, don't you? So we assumed it was because he issued those visas. The Japanese government always maintained that the resignation was prompted by the necessary downsizing of the diplomatic corps in the occupied country. But the Sugihara family believes it was a punishment, and Chiyune was devastated. I still can remember his face. He was speechless when he came back. We understood right away that you know, it was not a good news. He was so discouraged that I think he didn't want to talk, not even mention about the subject. Even the next day, for a week or months, he didn't say anything. At 47 years old, Sugihara was left without a career. Then, just months later, his seven-year-old son, Haruki, died suddenly. 
一番下の子はまだ小学校の一年生だったんですけれどやはりあの Our youngest was still a first grader. He was just seven years old. In the war, we'd had so many difficulties until we got back to Japan. We were eating horrible food. I think he was weakened during the travel. I feel so much sadness and regret. The family struggled emotionally and financially. For years, Sugihara refused to talk about the visas or ask for any help. He was forced to take a series of menial jobs. He started working in a supermarket, working in a small shop, like I remember. And、uh, he, he took any job. Just to support the family. Sugihara ultimately took a position with a trading company in Moscow, making use of his fluency in Russian. He worked there for 16 years, but his family remained in Japan. His life in Russia was a long way from the prestigious embassy position he always dreamed of. I remember once I stopped in Moscow to visit him, and、uh, he was staying in a hotel. He had one room, and he said he would invite me for dinner. So I thought, oh, must be nice dinner. But he, he said he is going to cook. He took me to the supermarket in Moscow, and he bought、uh, some potato and、uh, sausage, and he cooked in his toilet. He has a small electric cooking、uh, plate. And that was his、uh, dinner. I mean, it was something special for him. During this time, several Sugihara survivors searched for him, hoping to thank him for all he had done. The Japanese government claimed it had no information. He could not be traced, partly because he was now living under the name Senpo Sugiwara, perhaps fearing the Russians would still remember his negotiations so long ago in Manchuria. At last, in 1968, an Israeli diplomat and visa recipient, Joshua Nishri, found Sugihara. We never knew whether the Jewish people were actually saved and were able to go through Japan to freedom. When Mr. Nishri came, we found out for the first time. My husband was so glad to hear that. He felt relieved. He said what he did wasn't in vain. The survivors wanted to honor Sugihara, but he resisted the accolades. The only gift he accepted was a college scholarship to Hebrew University in Israel for his son Buki. In his declining years, Sugihara returned from Moscow and lived simply with his family in the town of Kamakura near Tokyo. For the first time, he had the opportunity to know his grandchildren. But sadly, the years of struggle and pain had changed him. It was now difficult for them to know the true nature of Tsuyuki Sugihara. In my memory. I only remember his face, and he barely smiled. Certainly, he must have experienced a lot of difficulties as a diplomat during the war. A person who's been through such adversity and death, he become quite weakened. Once, my grandfather was a big man. But he became smaller and smaller. It was unbearable for me to see. Then, in 1985, Sugihara was selected for a rare honor. 
he became the only Japanese citizen to be honored by the Israeli Holocaust Memorial, Yad Vashem, as righteous among the nations, a recognized rescuer of Jews. But Sugihara was too frail to attend the ceremony. More and more people now learned of the story, and many questioned why Sugihara wrote the visas and asked for nothing in return. One theory links Sugihara with the architects of the plan to import Jewish refugees to Manchuria. However, in a rare television interview, Sugihara denied knowing of the plan. No, I did not know it then, although someone may have connected me to it later. If I had known about such a plan, it would definitely have made issuing the visas a much easier thing to do, because then I would not have to have taken on the sole burden of responsibility for the act. Rabbi Marvin Tokayer was the leader of the Jewish community in Tokyo in the 1960s and 70s. For over four years, he pursued a meeting with Sugihara. Finally, Sugihara agreed, and Tokayer was able to ask him why. So when I asked him, why did you do it? He did not understand the question. It made no sense to him. So I'm a simple person. Someone says to do a favor or you have an opportunity to help someone in your lifetime, do it. And he said, in life, do what's right because it's right and leave it alone. No ulterior motive, do what is right. Don't make money from it. Don't write an article about it. Don't publicize it. Do what's right because it's right. In July of 1986, Jiune Sugihara passed away. He was 86 years old. I think he hid his kindness in his heart. His face was always stern. He had a very unique sense of humor. We were too small to get it. He would tell strange jokes that I couldn't understand. I used to think he was such a strange old man. He was so bad at expressing his feelings. By the time I found out that he was such a warm-hearted person and I was able to talk to him, he died. I was very sad. I wish I could talk to him more. This is the Hill of Humanity, a monument built to pay tribute to Chiune Sugihara. Hidden high above his hometown of Yaotsu, it was erected in 1992 to honor a national hero. Our keynote speaker tonight, Rabbi Reuven Cohn, is a popular and engaging teacher of adult Jewish education. His primary teaching is for the innovative Maya program at Hebrew College and for the Maimonides School in Brookline. Reuven received his BA in mathematics and his rabbinic ordination from Yeshiva University in New York. He did advanced graduate work at Harvard University in medieval Jewish history under Professors Tworsky and Yoroshami. He holds a JD from Yale Law School and practiced law for 20 years in the areas of high tech, venture capital, and medical research. <coughs> Reuven's parents received a visa from Japanese counsel Chiune Sugihara in August of 1940. 
we welcome this evening Rabbi Reuven Cohn. see all the flags. It's overwhelming for me to think that in this context, here in Lynn, I am going to get a chance to speak something of the debt that my family has to Consul Sugihara. And then when I look around and I see that the Consul General of Boston is here, to me, you are in a direct line with Consul Sugihara. And now my task is to convey to everyone here something about that time and place, such a different time than what we have here surrounded by all these welcoming flags. Now, uh, the time that we're talking about is 70 years ago. That's a long period of time. I myself am 62 years old. So this is about events that happened before I was born. Yet in the house in which I was raised in Roxbury, Massachusetts, these events were so real that I can feel them personally and I want to convey them to you the way I feel them. Now, my father was Rabbi Moses J. Cohn. Some of you may have heard of him. He was one of the leading Jewish educators in America. He was the founding principal of Maimonides School in Brookline. Fine. That's if we were talking about his resume. My father passed away 16 years ago. He is one of the people who lived this story. My mother is still alive and well at age 93, and she knows that I am here tonight talking about Kovna, Kaunas, Lithuania, Vilna, Lithuania, and Kobe, Japan. And when I talked to her last night, uh, my parents' language at home was Yiddish, and I was I didn't ask for her approval. I'm not sure what, what she would say if she were here. This is, I am not telling you her story. I'm actually telling you my story. But one thing she said to me that was so striking, she said, it was an under a welt. It was a different world than the world we're living in now. So let me first take you back to my own childhood in Boston, Massachusetts. Very early on, when did I find out that my parents had been in Japan for six months from January through June 1941? I need to think about that. When did I find out? Well, the first thing that I found out, even before I went to school, is that there was a very big difference between the street where I played and the home in which I lived. In the street where I played, again, I was born in 1947, so I'm thinking 1950, 51, 52, the word Japanese was not pronounced in a kindly manner. People still felt with full righteous indignation the memory of Pearl Harbor. I could only compare it to the way we today look back at 9-11 as something of great vividness. And I don't even want to repeat what you would hear if ever you mentioned Japanese or Japan. That was out in the street. In my home, Japanese, that was said with lovingness. Japan, I don't remember details, but Japan was a safe haven. There was a calm to that word. And since it was the home, the word was Japan. 
and the people of Japan who welcomed my parents so lovingly were the Japaner. Now, by the quirks of Yiddish, Konsul Sugihara was also their Japaner. And I don't know whether my parents even knew his name. Der Japaner was a good man, they would say. Now, when did I learn how to, what this was all about? Why in the home there was a different message? Well, let me share a memory from grade one. And why do I remember it was in grade one? Because it revolves around the reader. Now, probably to th that we used in school, some of the younger people will think that I'm talking about McDuffie's reader, but I'm not that old. It, the reader, I went to Maimonides School where my father was principal. It was a Jewish day school. But the reader was a reader that was used in every school in America. Anyone here from the, who were the heroes? Alice and, Je no, 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 we didn't do Dick and Jane. Alice and Jerry, their dog Spot. Run, Alice, run, no, run, Spot, run. And then, as you got to be a better reader, the world expanded a bit. Alice and Jerry go to visit their grandparents in the country, the countryside. And I come home from the first grade, and I ask my mother, where are, do I have grandparents in the country? How come I don't? have grandparents, where are they? And I remember my question, and I remember my mother saying, well, explaining. She said, well, you know, my father died when I was just 14, and your father's father actually died around the same time. So those are the grandfathers. And she said, and remember, when you were three years old, your grandmother, who lives in Israel, she was visiting. So that's your grandmother. And then she said, my mother was the Harget, which is Yiddish. She spoke in Yiddish. And I remember my head was dizzy. Is the Harget killed? Is the Harget murdered, and I said, she was the Hargit? Did she do something bad? I thought it was like capital punishment or something. And my mother turned pale, and she said, no, she didn't do anything bad. There were very bad people once upon a time. They were called Nazis, and they killed you just because you were Jewish. That's what she told me. And that was the first time I heard the word Nazi. Now, I am sure that she went on to reassure me. I don't remember those details. I think that she must have said, but don't worry, even then there were also good people. Even then. And I think that that's when she told me about their stay in Japan in fuller terms. In any event, I have another memory. How do you mark time? When you're a kid, you mark time by school events. I have a memory from grade two in the Jewish school. And I came home again all excited because there was going to be a play in the second grade, and I was choos chosen for a great part what was the part? It was a Hanukkah play. And I was going to play Judah Hama the Maccabee, who saved the Jewish people. OK, so you need a costume. So my mother's helping me with a costume. Here I am. I'm going to save the Jewish people. And she pulled out a, something that she had brought with her from Japan, a kimono. And that's how I went up on the stage as Judah Mac the Maccabee wearing a kimono. And throughout elementary school, every time I had a part, Mordechai saving the Jewish people, this one saving the Jewish people, I wonder what my classmates thought about 
why I was always wearing a kimono. And so in my family, the savior of the Jewish people came with a kimono. That was, that is one of the messages that I need to share, that this image affects you and stays with you your whole life. And it determines many of your decisions. And it makes you excited when you see so many flags instead of just your own flag. Okay, now, what is it that Sugihara actually did? Okay, uh, I hope you don't mind. I want to give you a little more detail than you might want. But I hope you'll, I hope you'll stay with me on this. What did Sugihara do? Sugihara issued in June 1940 some 2,200 transit visas, allowing the recipient to pass through Japan and to spend up to 10 days in Japan. Now, what was the world like then? I think Sheldon Dr. Cohen mentioned the Evian Conference of 1938. Now, I actually, in addition to teaching adults, I teach 10th graders. And to the 10th graders in Maimonides, I teach modern Jewish history. We come to the Evian Conference in 1938 when no country wanted Jewish refugees. And my students feel they understand it fully. Check. Anti-Semitism everywhere. And I try to shake them out of that. And I ask them the following question. How many countries are eager to accept penniless, destitute refugees? So what's the answer? No one is interested in a penniless, destitute refugee. And I think Resonances of this, this attitude are still with us today. Now, uh, now, so uh, Sugihara was willing to issue visas that would allow Jews to pass through Japan. Who were these Jews who were lucky enough to get this visa? For this, we have to go again right back to 1940. World War II begins when? What's the date? September 1st, 1939. Maybe. A week earlier, the unthinkable alliance came into being. The sworn enemies, Nazism and Communism, became allied. And that is really the start of World War II. There was a secret part of that treaty in which Stalin and Hitler agreed to divide up Poland. Okay? Now, uh, now, there was, were several free countries in that area, the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Now, uh, short, my father, who was born in Germany in 1913, went to study in Poland at a rabbinical seminary and was in a, the, one of these renowned rabbinical seminaries, the Miri Yeshiva, when war broke out. Lucky enough to be in the part of Poland that was taken over by the Russians, except People who were in the Russian zone didn't feel so, as we say in Yiddish. They didn't feel so, ay, ay, ay. Yeah. Okay. That was a message from my mother. She just, she just, she, she just called and she said, this is how I raised you? The, um, the, uh, 
the, uh, don't you dare tell her I made a joke at her expense. The, um, so where was I now? Yeah, uh, yes, okay. Anybody who was a student in a yeshiva was in great danger under the atheist communist regime that was introduced in Eastern Poland. And it was scary. Was it better to be in Eastern Poland than Western Poland? We know the end of the story, and we know that, of course, that was the case. Okay, now, <coughs> Russia announces about a month after the start of the war that it was taking the whole Vilna region of Eastern Poland and returning it to Lithuania. Now, Russia does not give gifts for no reason. Okay. What was less well known was the Lithuanians were forced to accept, I believe, 30,000 Russian troops to be stationed throughout Lithuania. Any event, somebody in my father's school hears on shortwave radio that the Russians are about to cede Vilna area to Lithuania. Overnight, the entire student body of 300 students pick up and go to Vilna. Why? It was impossible to cross borders, but you wouldn't have to cross a border. You would move to Vilna, and within a couple of weeks, Vilna would be Lithuania. Great plan, and, and uh, the problem with the plan was, within several months, Russia invades Lithuania, and the 300 people of whom my father is part of that group suddenly are back under the atheist communist bear. To the West, they know of atrocities, and they need to do something. We've got to get out of here. Can anyone ever leave the communist-controlled area? Now, this is where Sugihara enters. Consul Sugihara prepared a list of 2,200 visas that he gave within a month's time because after the Russians invaded, they informed Sugihara and all other consuls that they needed to get out. There was no longer a need for them. Okay, now, so we are back with Sugihara and his list. I first heard about this list when it was discovered by Professor Hillel Levine of Boston University. He discovered it in the archives of the Japanese Foreign Office. And every book I've looked at shows you a photograph of a page or two. Well, it turns out, as I was preparing for this talk, I'm Googling and looking and reading and rereading just to check my facts. And the entire list is available online at jewishgen.org. But first you have to register, and then you have to do searches. You can search for a name. So I managed to, I was hollishing for this list. I was dying for this list. I, I tricked the computer because I did a, a, a word search for various dates. And the, I ended up printing out the first 20 pages of the list. And I just want to be, my eyes will be your eyes. I want to look with you at the beginning of the list. Can you hear me? Okay. The, um, the, uh, the beginning of the list, at a time that nobody, but nobody cares about refugees. Should a diplomat care about refugees? What is the job of a diplomat? Is the job of the diplomat to welcome refugees into his country? 
That's not the job description. The job description is help us control our borders. And that's what makes Sugihara so unusual. Now, I'm reading just the beginning of the list with you, and I'll tell you why. The first visa, July 9th. One visa on that day. July 15th, one visa. 16th, one. 19th, two. 24th, three. 25th, four. Okay? Up to now, all of these people have been either Lithuanian, German, or Polish citizenship. <laughs> How's that? <coughs> this is not working. Okay, so I need to get back to this list. I need to get back to this list. The people who were from Lithuania were not going to get out. The Russians would not let them out. Okay. What happens on July 26th? 13 visas. But there is a new country of origin. There are two people from Netherlands. Rachel Sternheim, her husband, her Polish husband, Isaac Lewin, and what I know was her brother, Levi Sternheim. And this is where the story becomes complex. They come to Sugihara because they had corresponded with a, they were Dutch citizens. They could not return home because Holland was under, under German occupation. They wrote to the Dutch consul in, in Latvia saying, do something for us. We are Dutch citizens. And uh, maybe we can get into one of the Dutch colonies. He writes back and says, oh, actually, it's not so great in the Dutch East Indies at the moment. And for Curaçao, on the northern part, just north of South America, you don't need a visa. They write back, could you stamp our passport? He writes, sure. Passport will read, uh, no visa required for entry into Curaçao. Entry is contingent upon permission granted by the governor of the island upon entry into island waters or something like that. They write back, could you write on our visa just the first part and leave out the second part because uh, uh, just, okay. And this is what they present to Sugihara. Sugihara has absolutely no authority to issue a visa for someone to come and settle in Japan. But he can issue a transit visa if you have an end point. And these few people had an end point, Curaçao. Now, historians are trying to figure out what happened next. How active was Sugihara in the next step? But the next step was hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people get visas to go to Curaçao and start lining up at the Japanese consul for transit visas. Did Kusugihara know that this was not quite kosher? Remember your father said what an expert he was in the Russian language? This was a sophisticated man. Did he think he would get a promotion for this? You don't get promotions for this kind of stuff. He looked the other way and gave visas upon visas upon visas until he had to leave Kovna at the end of August. 2,000 
200 visas. Transit visas now. Starting August 10th, he started issuing transit visas even to people who somehow couldn't get the Curaçao end visas. That was, again, daring and morally courageous. Now, why am I giving you all these complications about the Dutch the, now? But because part of this story is not just the Sugihara story, it is the story of the Dutch consul in Latvia, who then authorizes the honorary Dutch consul in Kovna to issue these sort of fake N visas. That person's name was Jan Svartendik. And to me, one of the lessons, if the lesson we take away from this is, if you ever find yourself as Japanese consul in Kovna, you should be sure to give transit visas to refugees. If that's the lesson, we'll all, we all promise we will learn that lesson. But if the lesson is what I think Hillel Levine calls a conspiracy of kindness, if one person stands up and does what's right, that was the consul in Latvia, and then there's a chain from him to the consul in Kovna. And then somehow there's a chain from him to consul Sugihara. And then there are more people in the chain. This is about what you saw in the film. If you do the right thing, it, if you do the brave thing, it is contagious. That to me is one of the most important lessons of the Sugihara affair. I think you can tell that for me this is not at all easy to talk about. And the reason is simple. I am looking at my own life passing in front of me. Would I have existed upon this planet would someone have been come over to me, able to come over and say, stand a little closer to the mic? I would not have been but for people standing up and doing the right thing. I want to take you a little further onto the list. There are 2,200 people. We left off July 26th when those Dutch citizens walked in, 13 people that day. July 27, 42 people. August 1st, 198. August 2nd, 92. August 3rd, the day I'm interested in is August 5th. 392 visas were issued. Okay? This is, that alone is drudgery, time, and effort. And on the list, Number 1072, Moses Josias Cohn of Germany. That was my father. Why is my mother not on this list? My mother had escaped to Lithuania on her own. She was a teacher. She was actually a feminist. She was one of the first Orthodox Jewish women to get a higher Jewish education. And last night she was talking to me. She said, I don't know how I did it. I was all alone. And I, I just, and she said, you know, if you needed to contact someone on the telephone, you had to go to the drugstore and wait. There apparently were not yet cell phones. Okay? My mother found herself in Kovna, escaped to Kovna, and she went, life went on. She was at a wedding. She met my father. Mm -hmm. They had a date. And she proposed to him. She said, I have no papers. I have never left Poland. Would you be willing to do a fake state wedding so that I can travel on your papers? And he agreed. 
now. <coughs> one act of kindness about, of one person is contagious. That was the act of kindness that my father did. They traveled their separate ways and came to America on the same boat, June 28, 1941, the Kamakuramaru. <coughs> she went to her brother in New York. He went to his cousin in Boston. Uh, they started corresponding, and three months later, they married, this time for real. When I tell my friends this story, they, they say, I, this is just too unreal. In any event, uh, I will leave it at this. There are more details. I won't give you more details. But, oh, I do have one more detail to give you. Moses Josias Cone, number one se 1072. That became the visa also for the pseudonym, the, the, the so-called Mrs. Cohn, the later to be Mrs. Cohn, my mother. They ultimately married. They had four children. I am number three. The four children are all married. One of them married twice. <laughs> and my older brother has one child. My sister has four children. I have two children. My younger brother, four children from the first marriage, two from the second. Many of the grandchildren are married. A direct line living today from this visa, number 1052, 1052, including my mother, who is still alive, is 50 people. That is the ratio if you were trying to calculate what did this 2,200 mean? Okay. So I hope I've given you a little bit of the feeling of intensity that goes with living this type of history. When I spoke about it last time, I mentioned the dilemma that I felt when somebody told me, all excited, that Sugihara's son was going to be someplace or other, and did I want to go travel to meet him? Or, no, you know what? I'm not remembering it right. Oh, yeah, I'm already getting old. It was, that meeting had already taken place. Should they keep me in mind if there were another opportunity? And I really had to think through, what would it mean if I met Sugihara's son? Would I say, oh, Hello, maybe I would learn to bow in the Japanese manner. You know, thanks to your father's brave action, I am alive today. I get to breathe on this planet. So let's do lunch. <laughs> How do you show gratitude? And the simple answer is make an analogy to the gratitude you're supposed to show to your parents for bringing you into this world. You can't do it can't do it. It's so complicated. And the understanding that I have come to is the life that my parents led at fighting for Jew education of Jewish children in America, precisely the children who were not meant to be, that was a way of thanking Konsul Sugihara and the Japanese people. My speaking tonight about this is part of that thank you. And I am giving a charge to all of you. I am asking you to join me in those thanks by to Consul Sugihara by keeping in mind that just as bad behavior is so contagious, heroic behavior is also contagious. And if you do something heroic, There'll be somebody to join you. Not right away sometimes, but they will join you. Thank you.
So we will now take some questions from the audience. Was the Fugu plan with respect to the corn? The Fugu plan. I would ask if maybe a few people have, if a few people have questions and I'll try to answer them all. Uh, your, your question was how accurate was the Fugu plan? Uh, any other questions? I want to say you were not applauding me. I know that. And I'm just like everyone else. I like applause, but you weren't applauding me. You were applauding the story that I shared with you. Now, if there are no other questions, there is a book called The Fugu Plan. It's very sloppy, and its premise, as I understand it, is there was a reason for this. There was something to be gained from this. And why do people go in that direction? Because we're looking to make sense out of the world. And if that book is claiming that there were ulterior motives, it makes us feel good when we don't do things for, ulterior, for the right reason. Um, the, I believe there is still a lot of research to be done on this issue. There are two books about Sugihara, one by Hilla Levine, one by I forget whom. Uh, I don't know that either of these people understands Japanese. Uh, there are lots and lots of documents that are available. Hilla Levine tried to carefully trace Sugihara's behavior and his sense of it is that Sugihara, you know, you mentioned he was turned down three times. That is a simplification. Sugihara seems to have been very clever in what he told Japan back home and what he didn't. And when you read that record, you get a sense of someone working carefully to preserve all of his various constituencies as, as a diplomat should. But what's amazing is he had decided that these penniless refugees were a constituency of his. So let, let, me ad let me address this issue. Hilla, Levine, Hilla Levine's book, In Search of Sugihara, has a lot of good stuff in it. I couldn't read it from cover to cover until I was preparing for this. I had to force myself to read it because he goes into so much speculation about motives and I am a product of the deed and the motive is just not that important to me. It is the deed. He did it. Now, uh, Levine talks about Jacob Schiff, who helped finance the, uh, uh, the Japanese in the Russo-Japanese War as a protest against the Tsar's mistreatment of the Jews. Okay, so the question is, what historical memory was there in 1940 of that fact. Now, uh, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. Uh, but as I said, to me, that search for motive is not what it's about. It's I am searching for right behavior, not necessarily for right motive. Uh, I will also tell you the stories that my parents told me about their six months in Japan. Japan was getting on fo war footing. My mother would say, you know, it's such a crowded country. Between the ties of the railroad track, people would grow stuff. The land was so precious. So here you had, what, 
5,000 Jewish refugees where land is so precious, and they did it because of Jacob. Uh, my parents talked about the simple kindnesses of simple Japanese people that they experienced on a daily basis. And that's also part of the story. The Jacob Schiff story awaits careful historical analysis, and I hope I'm still alive when it's finished. <laughs> Any? As I said, you need to read those two books to assess what precisely was the resistance of the Japanese government. Um, it's not even clear that Sugihara was fired. He certainly was let go. Japan, uh, it's, there's still a lot to be done, a lot of research. Now, what did you ask? <laughs> oh, so. Some of the refugees were stopped in Vladivostok at the end of the 11-day journey in the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and some of the refugees who didn't have transit visas were not, you know, they had a tough time until the Jewish community of Kobe, Japan, intervened. Um, uh, Hilla Levine speculates that there was a matter of honor that once a Japanese consul had issued a transit visa, if the government did not honor them, it would be somehow airing its dirty laundry to its perennial enemy, the Russians. So, yes. Um, but, but my parents personally did not experience any, any negatives during their six months in Japan. I had a question, but I also wanted to apologize for not recognizing you when I opened the program tonight. I, I, I was going to, and I apologize for that. Um, and I really appreciate your being here, Rabbi. I, I have a p question, though. I think everyone in the room knows why the 2,200 people were in danger. But could you say more about uh, the fact that many in the world were ignoring the, the beginning of the Holocaust? Um, how did Mr. Sugihara come to realize and, and know what their fate might be and, and w what would have come to pass had he not done what he done he did? Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a difficult question to respond to. Um, let me, instead of talking about Mr. Sugihara, let me talk about my own parents. My father was from Hamburg, Germany. Did he know what was coming? He, you know, his whole life he used to talk about the things he witnessed. He said the terrible street brawls between the communists and the Nazis in Hamburg. Okay. Uh, it's not clear to me that he expected what actually happened. And I'll tell you something else. When the entire yeshiva picked up and left near their town, the head of the yeshiva, should I tell you this? I'll tell you this. This my father only told me at a difficult time of his life when he was 65 and was forced to retire. And he tells me this story. He says, the head of the yeshiva asked me to stay behind in not to go to Vilna because his elderly father-in-law who was the rabbi of the town, was too old to travel. Now, the head of the yeshiva said to my father, if, if the Germans ever come here, you're a German citizen. You'll be safe. That story tells me so much about what people expected. By the next, my father actually stayed. Everyone left. The next day, he looked around the town and he said, all that are left here are the communists. I've got to get out of here. Many of the people who benefited from Sugihara's largesse had a strong awareness of the danger that the Russians uh, were to them. 
and not clear how much awareness they had of what the Germans were capable of doing. Yeah. I don't, is that a... How did... Sugihara knew that these people were trying to get out of Russia, that they were, many of them were uh, religious, and they were in danger now that it was occupied by, uh, by Russia. He also knew there were people from Poland who had managed to escape, who had witnessed atrocities. And that was also a source of information for him. I think I can sit down now. You were a really a very, very special audience. Thank you for this opportunity. Feel free to get out the pink sheets of paper in your folders in order to look at an excerpt of the song entitled Sugihara by David Rovix. At this time, I would now like to introduce Chorus Boston, whose goal is to enjoy singing while striving to attain a high level of musical performance. This group was established in 1997, and their current conductor is Tetsuo Yagi. Please come up. Thank you.
Great program.
behalf of the Tolerance Committee, I want to thank you, Rabbi Cohen, for your comments, your reflections, uh, your feelings about uh, your parents and uh, Sugihara's work to uh, save them and others. I want to thank everyone who participated in our program this evening, and to you who attended, thank you. In your folder, you'll find a blue brochure, and on the back is a list of the members of the Tolerance Committee. Please stand as I call your name, for we applaud your tireless efforts in behalf of these forums. Professor Richard Adelman, Dr. Lisa Altamari, <laughs> Professor Ulysses Arcos Castrillon, <laughs> Susan Benoit, Dr. Wayne Burton, <laughs> Professor Bruce Chiarmella, <laughs> Marjorie Detkin, Dr. Cheryl Finkelstein, Vice President Paul Friedrich, <laughs> Professor Rose Gould, <laughs> Director Catherine Gravino, <laughs> Professor Yusuf Hayes, <laughs> David Hull, <laughs> Emily Jones, <laughs> Diana Carey, Betty Kiva, Darren Klein, Dr. Manette Lal, Nicole Levy, Harvey Michaels, Lisa Milso, Lori Monaco, Peter Monaco, Professor Walter Mott, Gerard Sullivan, Kathy Sullivan, <laughs> Professor Musa Traori, <laughs> Bonnie Weiss, <laughs> Dr. Elizabeth Williams, <laughs> Pamela Nolan <laughs> <Dolan> Young, <laughs> a bouquet of gratitude goes to Patricia Lavoy, who engineered every detail of the 26th form, as well as the earlier ones. So we'll call upon Patricia Lavoy to take a bow and step forward. busy working on the next forum for which you will receive an invitation if you've signed up for our mailing list. Thank you again for attending. Good evening and sayonara. <laughs>